From Chicago's CAN TV, this is Chicago Newsroom. Well, hi there. Welcome to Chicago Newsroom here on CAN TV. You know, it just occurred to me we never got around to writing a mission statement for Chicago Newsroom, but if we had, you know, if we'd actually took the, taken the time to do it, it would probably have said that we highlight and celebrate great journalism in Chicago that both brings to our attention things we didn't know were going on and that causes or encourages change in the status quo. Yeah, I should write that down. I think we should. I, th I think that's a good one. Well, anyway, we have a double show for you today. Two conversations with journalists who did both of those things within the past couple of weeks. In both cases, providing multiple reports on complicated topics that took months to uncover. A little later, we're going to be talking about how the BGA and WBEZ discovered that not one elevator in any CHA high-rise building appears to have been inspected at all in 2016 and how that jeopardized thousands of mostly elderly residents. But first, the Chicago Tribune's absolutely remarkable Betrayed series about sexual abuse in the Chicago public schools. 520 cases of juvenile sexual assault in 10 years. It's complicated and we'll get into it. Stories of beloved teachers and coaches carrying on sometimes lengthy sexual relationships with underage students and a creepy, a, a term I'd never heard before, a creepy term called grooming. The Tribune went all in on this story, committing, if you count the credits, if you read the credits, the small letters there, 22 people worked on these stories, along with the legal muscle of the company's lawyers. And I'm proud to say that two of those four, of the four reporters on the story are with us today. 50% of the reporting team is right here with us. Juan Perez Jr. back at the table. Glad to have you here. And uh, you've got a lot to talk with you about, Juan. So thanks for being here today. And also joining us today, uh, Jennifer Smith Richards, uh, are your first time with us. And I'm so happy to have you here too. Uh, now, are you are you on the investigative team at the Tribune? Is that that that's your assignment? I am. Yeah, I'm an investigative reporter, and I have a specialty in data analysis. Uh, and boy, did you need did they need data analysis on this one, huh? Yeah. True. Yeah. Well, um, I, I think we probably just need to start with some numbers, although I'm assuming that many people are already kind of familiar with the story, but. Uh, I, I use that number, 520 cases juvenile sexual assault in 10 years. It's, that's a weird number because it includes a lot of things, but is that a good place to start, one? I think for starters, and Jen can explain this more because that analysis was awesome. Because yeah, it's I'm, data I'm, analysis. I'm, I'm going to say stuff like that <laughs> right. a lot. But we know do. that since 2008, we have that roughly 500 number of instances in which the Chicago Police Department responded to a CPS school building to investigate a report of sexual misconduct that involved a juvenile victim, right? Mm -hmm. That is true. Right, and it would have had to occur inside the building, mm -hmm. the, the assault or the abuse. Um, it had a juvenile victim, and right. it could have been an, either an adult perpetrator. Um, we don't know for certain that they were all school employees, but an adult. Mm -hmm. And it also could have included another student. Right. right. And, the, and there's another universe, too, that we should explain as well. It's because since 2011, we know now, the district has acknowledged to us, that they have investigated, quietly, internally, more than 400 cases of sexual misconduct involving an adult employee of the school district and a juvenile victim. That can be abuse, that can be harassment, that can be grooming. And they've substantiated more than half of those cases during that time period as well, which was I, I missed surprising this. Four, to us. Say that again, 400 in what period of time? It's uh, 430, yep. actually, since 2011. Just since um, 2011. Just since 2011. Right. And these are, th th one of the triggers for this is the Chicago Police Department was involved in this in some way. Is that right? No. No. Oh, okay. This so is the we're, district's we're really own internal You've got a lot of work to, to, to right. bring me along. On so this. this is this is oh this is the district itself. Correct. Their okay. internal right. investigation. So we started with wow. this universe of of police of crimes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That had occurred, and and had this number, and we were pressing the district uh, throughout this time to explain to us, well, how many are you investigating? I you know, see. Is it okay. really 500? Right. Yeah, yeah. How many are you investigating? Yeah. And they came back and said, um, since 2011, that they personally, their internal um, law department, had investigated 430 cases and then substantiated uh, a little more than half of those, saying that, yes, a school employee did, in fact, abuse, assault, or harass, sexually harass a child. Now, in your stories, there's this other number, 72, right? Mm -hmm. You, you mm -hmm. identified 72 staff. 
explain well, this. Adult perpetrators, I guess, is how we would describe them, right? How does how right. does your how does your number and your investigation differ from what Jennifer just said? What what so, what is that? Right. So that seventy two is a subset of of either of those numbers. Mm -hmm. right. um, what we did was work very hard to go deep on as many cases as we could, where we could identify who was the school employee who committed the acts, mm -hmm. what happened, were they charged with a crime, was there a civil suit, um, did they have their educator licenses revoked, did the district fire them? Um, so we were able to piece together from many different sources wow. a lot of information about 72 cases. Um, that's just from what, what we right. could see. And yeah. you have to remember that these are involving juveniles, and so mm -hmm. um, a lot of the information about what happened in any sort of abuse case is, is not public. You cannot get to it. Which is, which is another fascinating issue here because you were able to interview something like 18 actual students, right, who, who are presently students. And that would seem like a kind of a low number, but when you think about it, that means 18 families were willing to have their child identified in the Chicago Tribune. That's right. a well, so it's, it's 18 victims, and some of them have, have since graduated and are right. older. And I just, I do want to oh, point some out are, that we, some are graduates. Yeah, some we, are took, graduates. we took great care to not, um, not approach child victims you know, and current students. We approached parents and families um, just, just to be you know, additionally mm -hmm. careful yeah. with kids yeah. who have been victimized yeah. by, by an adult. Well, I'm sure that would be a real issue is that, is that you could be in a situation of identifying someone even, you know, if it's a year after they've been in the school, but you could publish information that would clearly identify someone and who might not want it have to have been identified. So you have mm -hmm. that working in the stew while you're doing all the rest of the investigating. I mean, I want to say that some of our primary objectives here were to, first of all, get a sense as best as we could with the limitations that we had with the district pushing back on us. We want to get an idea of how broad the scope of this problem is, right? Just to get an idea of how pervasive has this been, mm -hmm. how widespread is it, how long has it been going on. And then in addition to that, you know, those numbers are shocking enough on their own, right? But what really brought this story home, I know for the reporting team, and certainly I hope for readers as well, were, were these students that we talked about who were brave enough to come forward and talk with us for hours and spill their guts to talk about what the shortcomings were, what, what weaknesses they felt had happened, what, you know, they continue to struggle with now, even after, you know, sometimes years in these instances. Mm -hmm. You know, there's the scope, sure, but these human stories, you know, I don't, I don't even have to say how powerful yeah, that was. Yeah. You just have to sit through that. I, I have so much that I want to ask you about, and there is so much to cover in this. I mean, it, I've read every word of it, and it literally takes a couple of hours to read because there is so much, mm -hmm. there is so much information. I want to tell you, though, that I just have this impulse to jump ahead to something that I think is so interesting about all of this, which is the role that social media and and phones play in all of this. There's hmm. one story that just kind of like curled my hair as I as you describe a teacher walking up to a girl in his class and taking the phone out of her hands and handing it back to her a few seconds later but his phone number is on there. And so that's how that's how predatory behavior begins in the digital age. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's easy access. You have to think, where are the you kids? know, where are the kids? Um, and, and people who want to prey on children go where the kids are. You know, they're on Instagram, right? Um, they're texting. They're, they're out there on social media, and, and that's where predators are, too. Mm -hmm. And this exposes a little bit of tension, too, in the, in the regular course of a teacher-student relationship, right? Because you have coaches out there. You have teachers. You have um, instructors, band, you know, band leaders, whatever, who in an effort to communicate with their students to keep them updated on, well, baseball practice is canceled today or, you know, here are the details for, you know, the rendezvous that we're going to have for the trip to the track meet, want to interact with their students, sharing assignments, things like that. That's mm -hmm. something that a lot of school districts and a lot of teachers have been trying to work through. Um, but at the same time, this is the challenge, right? Is, is it this potential exposure. Right. Um, and so that's the question that arises out of this, right? Or what are the policy recommendations that we have? Mm -hmm. How does the district mm -hmm. set forth what proper behaviors are, the proper use of the CPS computer network, right, yeah. to interact yeah. with students? Yeah. And then right. beyond that underlying policy, this so-called guidance that they say they distribute to teachers to talk to them about, 
what appropriate interactions are supposed to be between students and teachers in these formats. But at the same time, there's still a lot of confusion sometimes about where the lines should be and whether individual schools are supposed to come up with their own policies and practices or whether there should be a centralized, you know, edict coming down from the top that says, here's what you do, here's what you don't do. And what an incredible opportunity it is if, if you are a predator. If you, can, if you can mask yourself as a really engaged and wonderful and talented teacher and still avail yourself of all of these accesses, these access points to, to these children, it, that's what's, that to me was the biggest takeaway from this is, is that it, we live in this world where we're all vulnerable to, we're all vulnerable anyway, but we're now more vulnerable to predators because we, we give them our, our sort of digital access in mm -hmm. addition to other things. Sure. But, and, but, and what parent doesn't want their child to have a great mentor? Yeah. Somebody who's trusted right. and, and is working uh, you know, toward their, their kid's success. Right. And Who you, doesn't and, want that? And well you put. have these, these stunning examples of a beloved music teacher and a beloved coach. I mean, they're totally different stories in totally different schools, but they're so similar in the same way that the parents love the, the kids. The kids seem to love them. and. And right. then we they find out what they've been doing. Charismatic and involved and engaged and, and there to help those kids, you know, succeed and advance. And they were just completely trusted by those kids and, and the parents. And the principals, apparently. And the, and, yeah. Sure, yeah. and the principals. So tell, tell us some of these stories. If Daddy. you will, I mean, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I think it's sure. important. It's important not to have a sanitized discussion here. We we, we have to we have to delve into some of these right. god awful stories. So we explored all different types of stories here, right? There are yeah. stories of of grooming, as you said earlier, where um, a, a teacher or a coach is just getting too close to a student and then starts making sexual suggestions, and those those cases are not not physical, right? but they range all the way up to a really horrific case, um, one of, of Coach Gerald Gaddy, right, who was a volunteer track coach at Simeon. Um, the school welcomed him in without a proper background check. The district pushed back at some point and said, hey, this, this guy hasn't completed a full background check. He really needs to, he has, he has criminal history. School never completed this. <laughs> but in this time that this, this man is in the school, um, he gets close to female students on the track team and eventually rapes one um, more than 40 times and, and he's in prison now. And so I think that um, one of the takeaways from, from all of the work is that range, right, of the types of abuse mm -hmm. from emotional and, you know, sexually harassing all the way up to absolutely brutal rapes that happened inside the school. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, you know, well, you describe the, the, in, a, in an office overlooking the swimming pool right. this, this during had, class time. That's right. And this, this man had keys to the school. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the school had welcomed him, mm -hmm. and welcomed this, him in. And this was a good, bright student, too, whose, whose, whose life just completely, completely developed and eroded because of this case. This was a person who never should have been in the school building in the first place. This, one, of the, one of the big issues that this story brought to light was the issue of background checks, right? This was somebody that CPS said, you know what, the school flat out failed in its responsibilities to make sure that this guy's criminal history was never a matter that the school should have been worried about. Mm -hmm. CPS, um, in its efforts to kind of manage the fallout from this investigation and talk about what it has been doing and, and what it's now doing, uh, likes to emphasize that athletic coaches are a particular point of concern going forward when it yeah. comes to creating this kind of centralized process for making sure these people are cleared to work in the yeah. school building. Yeah. They like to talk about how um, their criminal background check process is one of the most strident and, and comprehensive in the state uh, or anywhere really. Um, but at the same time you see them now saying, you know, for example, the district didn't necessarily have any way of knowing for sure whether an employee was uh, arrested or convicted of a crime while they were working inside of the school building after they had already gone through this background check mm. process now, right? Mm -hmm. So only now do you see a, uh, a new policy or a new practice beginning to emerge where the district says they will begin doing these sorts of spot checks on employees moving forward to try to ensure that they can keep a sort of updated universe of what's happening um, in, as far as criminal proceedings are concerned. Um, but it, you know, it wasn't just the Gaddy case either. You know, Juan Ibarra, mm -hmm. um, someone who was uh, definitely had a, a criminal history involving sexual conduct uh, that would have 
easily raised a great deal of red flags to the school district while he was working there who, you know, that never happened. Um, you know, it's, th and this is just one facet of it, right? The background check thing is yeah, just right. one yeah. facet of this yeah. universe of yeah. things that we've tried to discuss on an You know, one I was thinking, uh, as I was reading through this, I, I was thinking about you and how you have, for the last few years, been covering the, the ongoing disaster that is Chicago Public Schools budgeting and management and, you know, uh, Barbara Bird Bennett, and we could go on, we could list that, that 25 thing long list. <laughs> Is it possible that the Chicago Public Schools have been so in crisis for so long and their leadership team has been so distracted by just trying to keep the doors open and the lights on that they just kind of let this stuff slide, that they never actually put anybody in charge of making sure this stuff isn't happening? To me, it's just maybe but but the thing that i keep coming back to and one thing that you and i were talking about earlier was mm -hmm. the fact that this has been pervasive for so long mm -hmm. that why didn't anybody acknowledge it mm -hmm. why did it take a chicago tribune investigation for people to realize well you know we better make a very proactive and extensive effort to try to clean this stuff up now mm -hmm. because you know the, the yes the crises have been what they are but this has been an undercurrent this has been an undercurrent that's been going on for a very long time right. and it's only now being addressed and and to me in this day and age and what's happening right now in our culture with us having to really have a deep reckoning about how yeah, we're how we yeah. conduct ourselves right. and how we treat the least powerful among us that this never really rose to the top. It, it's also very hard to argue that a school's primary responsibility above all else is to make sure that the children are safe. Yes. Are safe. Yeah. Period. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. right. Um, so it's, it's hard yeah. to imagine that um, that one of the first steps any school or district would wouldn't take would be to put in these child protective measures. Let's mm -hmm. make sure that mm -hmm. we're not allowing people with, um, you know, very troublesome criminal backgrounds to have mm -hmm. access to children. Yeah. Let's make sure that um, when there is an allegation of abuse, of child abuse in a school, that we don't leave the person who's been accused yeah. in the school. Yeah. Yeah. Just leave them there let's with the victim. Let's make sure that our investigations have some kind of standard and consistent framework that they use when conducting these investigations that also make sure that the victims who are involved aren't just ostracized or left without any kind of support or, or questioned, or, or again, or questioned and again, again, and again and again. One of the things that I think you brought to light that is just so dramatic is the role that the law department, the, the CPS law department plays in this. And we absolutely have to make sure we talk here about the idea of reporting and what is a, um, what, is, what is the term, um, designated reporter? Who is a designated reporter? reporter? Yeah. And how does it happen? It, so I'm, I'm, I'm garbling all of this up here because there's so much I want to say all at one time. But if you are a teacher and you observe a colleague teacher who you are really suspecting is something is going wrong and this just doesn't they're, they're just too familiar with the student the students are going to their house for dinner crap like that right who are you obliged to report to and what happens if you report it and nothing happens I mean I'm very confused about mm -hmm. Your story only made me more confused about what the reporting uh -oh. thing oh, is. No. Where does, well, where does DCFS fit in, and, right. and what role does the principal play? And and should should the school notify the parents of every of everybody in that school when there has been a charge made against one of the teachers? There are like thirty of these questions that right. you've raised. Thanks so, a lot. Well, let, so here is something that is so simple, right? Illinois has a mandated reporter law. If you are a school employee, a, a physician, um, a member of the clergy, a social worker, a counselor, it is crystal clear. If you believe that a child has been abused or you are told that there may be abuse or neglect of a child, you must immediately report to DCFS through their hotline. To DCFS a first. first. Period. Before you talk to the principal Period. or, yeah, okay. And C CPS has a, a policy to make this even clearer for its own employees that says, telling your principal in a school is not fulfilling the mandated reporter law. You are okay. personally responsible for reporting, all right? So that, there's no chain of command that you must go through. You must call DCFS first. 
that's not to say the principal doesn't get involved. That's right. not to say the district doesn't begin conducting its own investigation, although that's going to change. We'll talk about that a little bit later. That's not to say these other procedures and practices don't kick in. It's that the first point of contact that you're supposed to make is to DCFS. And that tends not to happen. If, if I, from the, the impression I get from your reporting is that in most of these cases, that was not what happened. Right. In right? many of these cases, no one reported to DCFS at all. They mm -hmm. may have talked amongst themselves. They mm -hmm. may have involved you know, an internal investigator, mm -hmm. um, but they did not report. And that means that those, those people who are trained to, um, to question children who have been abused mm -hmm. did not come in. That means that sometimes police did not get called when they could have been called. And, th and that it, matter just it, It's heartbreaking to see that what happened in so many cases is that the principal was the first point of contact and the principal immediately goes into reactive mode or defensive mode. It's like, whoa, this could, this could really hurt the image of the school. And again, going back to the stuff we cover all the time, the principal is looking at that bottom line about the student-based budgeting, and if I, lo if I start losing students, I'm going to start losing money, I'm going to lose faculty. We can't have this, right? So your impulse, I mean, I don't want to be, dis I don't want to defend it, but your human impulse is to like, oh, let's try to put a lid on this. And that's why, that's why you're not supposed to report it internally initially, right? You're supposed to report it outside the system. Because then what happens is the law department starts interviewing these kids, as you said, Jennifer, over and over again. Take it. I know you, you want to jump in. Please don't let there's, me. There's so much to talk about. I know, I know. We're, we're all like bursting to talk about this. What, one, of the, one of the big points of tension that we discussed in our series was the, was the dual roles that the law department has, right? It has this investigatory capacity mm -hmm. that requires it to get to the bottom of these incidents. And it also has the responsibility to defend the castle and protect the district against liability if a victim you know, decides to sue the district. Mm -hmm. um, so this is one thing that you're going to start see changing now. One of the developments that happened this week is you saw Chicago Board of Education President Frank Clark uh, propose, or really more of an edict, that uh, instead of the law department being the first point of contact on these investigations for the district, that responsibility will move over to Chicago Public Schools Inspector General Nicholas Schuler. Which makes sense because he's an inspector. This, right? would, uh, this would eliminate what Schuler has described as an inherent conflict of interest because mm -hmm. of this dual role that we've just right. discussed. So you think, that, uh, not you think, but does it, is there general sense that this is a good idea? That is a big development and it's certainly something that Schuler asked for, rather demanded, right. uh, just last week to the school board. Right. At the same Time, and I think, your story ignited that fire. I think there's certainly some surprise that the district responded this quickly to mm -hmm. it, though. W what this is going to boil down to, certainly in Schuler's view, is resources, right? Mm -hmm. Because let's, let's be clear here. Not only is Schuler going to be responsible for investigating these cases moving forward, mm -hmm. the second edict that's been given to him by the Board of Education, uh, once it's approved later this month, is that he is also going to be responsible for doing a backwards look, going back to at least 2000, Good. to examine all sorts of cases for any kind of wrongdoing, right? Mm -hmm. Either of those roles is a massive expansion of what the IG already has. Right. And you're, you remember, you're aware that Schuler has had some pro high profile conflicts with yes. the board and the district over his budget, over his authority delegated to Ask him. Ask Forrest Claypool about uh, Schuler, right? That certainly yeah. has come yeah. up, right? Yeah. Um, but now, Schuler said that like, even just one of these new tasks would shut down the current operations of his office, right? Mm -hmm. So now he faces an enormous challenge to quickly hire people yeah. who are qualified and are very good at this. And you get the sense perhaps that the city is, is saying, all right, man, you asked for it. Mm -hmm. Here you go. Mm -hmm. Good luck. Take care of yeah. it. Um, that's, it's so the, the, there are so many details that still need to be worked out on this to see how it's going to oh, work. Oh, absolutely. Um, but at yeah. the very least, you know, that's, that's what Schuler asked for. Now mm -hmm. he's, he's responsible for figuring and out how to deal with it. Not just whether it will work, but whether it will be best for kids. Correct. I mean, yeah. we've talked a lot about, yeah. you know, being trained in, in specifically interviewing right. children right. who have been sexually abused. This is a, a highly skilled practice well, area. You said yourself the, the, the number one job is safety, and, and there has not up until now been an infrastructure for guaranteeing safety, mm -hmm. and this might be that. I, we kind of didn't finish the other side of this thing with the, with the, the law department, though, because the, the huge thing that you've raised is this, this inherent conflict that the law department sits down with the kid and interviews the kid, mm -hmm. and then later on could be in the position of actually, like, challenging you that can, kid. You can pull on part, those right? same investigative files potentially and use them against the student. Right. So the, the law department has, has sat down with this child 
learned what happened, learned the details of what happened, has that file in front of them, and then when that child sues the district and says, you failed to protect me mm -hmm. from this monster, yeah. um, there's a lawyer from that same department who says, you know, you factually consented to sex with this man. Yeah. Factual yeah. consent. Yeah, that's yeah. that's language that's actually been used. Yes, I, I, right. And and it is yeah, it yeah. is sort of an alarming right right <laughs> an alarming mm. thing. And I mean, you even documented the, you know I mean just like the the classic what were you wearing? I mean mm. you know asking asking a sixteen year old girl who was assaulted by a teacher what were you wearing? Right. And what's your motivation? And for what was your forward? motivation? Right right. Yeah. I mean. And, and you know, it, it's parenthetical, and it's not something you reported on. But but you you also raise tangentially the idea that the CTU gets involved in this too, because the CTU defends teachers, and so you have you have CTU attorneys defending these teachers who have we have we think done egregious things, and I'm sure that's something that CTU is not all that doesn't want to be that public about that they have to defend some of these people. But that's that's the way it works, which is why you need an independent inspector general in there doing the job. And you know, I mean, well, go ahead. I interrupt. Well, I, I was going to say there yeah. there are a lot of you know when this happens in a school, there are a lot of competing interests, right? right. There's there are the interests of child protective workers, there's the interest of, you know, the principal wanting to protect her school or his school. There's the district wanting to, you know, sort of mitigate risk that might exist. Mm -hmm. Don't forget um, the student. There, and, yeah. and then yeah, don't, forget, forget, the don't forget the child. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, it's, it's a very complicated thing. And you're right. There are a lot of people, you know, who, who get involved when a child comes forward and says, I've, yeah. you know, I've been yeah. abused. Unfortunately, we're just about totally out of time here. And I did want to reserve some time just to ask you about the mechanics, the the the, opera, the the journalism of this. First of all, how did this story originate? What what was the spark that lit this? We've tried hard to remember this, but <laughs> <laughs> I think <laughs> it comes. Yeah, it's been a few months, but it, it came out of um, us looking at some some disciplinary data um, that came from Chicago Public Schools, mm -hmm. just sort of run of the mill discipline data, and starting to ask some questions and doing what journalists do and being mm -hmm. curious. Um, and then uh, from there, we started looking at police records and just sort of pulling a thread. How I'm fascinated big is this by problem? this. How, How big, is big is this problem? Yeah. What does yeah. the public yeah. record say? Yeah. What, do, what, do sta what does state law provide? You yeah. know, that's, that's yeah. one particular yeah. point of it, is just reading through statutes and seeing like, well, you know, what does the Personal Record Review Act say? Yeah. What do yeah. criminal yeah. codes c comply with, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it's it's I, been I, a blur. I, I've, <laughs> had this, I've had this conversation dozens of times at this table, and, and I, I find that it's often the same thing. Um, you know, Sarah Karp brought down Barbara Bird Bennett because she just happened to look at the thing in, the, in one of the budget things and said, why are they putting $20 million? What is that? You know, and that's why beat reporting is so important, and that's why I'm so glad you are one of the people on that, on that beat, and I'm so glad we have investigative people, too. I mean, it just... We talk about the death of journalism, but I would say right now journalism is doing pretty darn well in Chicago, and uh, and you guys are to be congratulated for this. This is this is quite a series, and it'll have legs. This this will have impact for months to come, I think. And hopefully protect kids. I know. Well, that's yes, that's that's, that's exactly the point. Thanks so much for being here. I, I really Thank enjoyed you. it, and you're, you know you're both welcome here anytime. And, and next time you do something, let, let's hear about it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. And Juan, I know we'll be talking to you about all of the other hoopla that goes on <laughs> in various times. Juan Perez Jr. is uh, the uh, education reporter for the Chicago Tribune. And uh, Jennifer Smith Richards is with the investigative unit. And we're just so glad to have had you both here. Um, we're going to take a very short break. And we're going to keep the show going because we're going to talk about the CHA in just a few seconds. In fact, the break we're going to take is 10 seconds long. Can you hold on? We'll be right back. This is Chicago Newsroom. See, I told you, 10 seconds. Welcome back to Chicago Newsroom. If you were with us for that earlier part of our show, you saw some outstanding reporting on a situation that's talking about dozens of CPS students who were harmed physically and emotionally by predators in their schools. But the BGA and WBEZ series we're about to examine is a little bit different. In this case, the reporters and the editors looked at a situation in which nobody had so far been at least physically hurt, but there was massive potential 
potential for a huge disaster and incredible inconvenience and frightening situations, all of it victimizing a vulnerable population. We're talking about the Chicago Housing Authority here. They're high-rise buildings in which thousands of residents live. Most of those residents are elderly and their lives depend almost entirely on one or two elevators in their buildings. And when they're not running, people can be literally trapped in their buildings or if they're outside their home, at least some of the before it happened, then they lose access to their homes for hours and hours. The BGA's Alejandra Cancino, along with WBEZ's Odette Youssef, did seven months of reporting on this issue. And I'm really pleased to welcome Alejandra to the table for the first time. Glad to have you here. Thank, Thank you, you for doing this. And um, I guess congratulations to your uh, your partner Odette, right? She's a new mom, as she I understand She is a new it. mom, yes. Yeah, she good. wishes she could be here today. Too. Well, Hi, Odette. I know you're watching. <laughs> um, let me start with quoting you back to yourself. I always love to quote things reporters do to themselves. An analysis of thousands of public records reveals none, none, that would be zero, of the 150 elevators then in the Chicago Housing Authority's fleet was inspected for the entire year of 2016. That would be 150 elevators. That would be none in 2016. The previous year records indicate that 136 of those elevators flunked an inspection, yet still were issued certificates by the city permitting their operation and attesting to their safety. As Donald Trump would say, what the hell is going on? Yeah, so, um, and we, we can backtrack a little bit because I think the story of, uh, of this um, inspection, how the inspections work in Chicago is kind of interesting. So, so back in 2009, the Chicago Tribune actually wrote a story about how city inspectors were not inspecting elevators. Um, and in fact, they had, some of them have gone years without an inspection. Mm -hmm. And so the city created a program um, that basically privatized inspections. So now the building owners are required to hire a private inspector to come and inspect the elevators. Um, um, and it was a way to fix the problem. Right now, we're going to require it to be inspected every year. And so in 2015, the CHA kind of went into this program and hired a private inspector to inspect the elevators. Um, and that was, that was the in year. 2015. 2015, okay. yeah. right. And then the next year, what happens? None of the elevators are inspected. Um, it is the building owner's responsibility, the mm -hmm. CHA's responsibility to inspect the elevators uh, and to hire someone to, to do so. Um, and, and they didn't do it. And they said, you know, they, their excuse is, that uh, you know there were um, uh, problems with the um, the way they issued the contract that year, and then it was rectified the the, the year following, so 2017. But still, it doesn't take away from the fact that. And I, I know the, C the CHA has argued that oh, they went through numerous directors and they were reorganizing themselves at that time, and you know all that kind of thing. But it's still, I mean. The bureaucracy has to continue on. These things have to continue. And, and it's just remarkable that something like that could have, could have happened. Now, one of the things I'm not clear on here is the CHA, obviously, as we know, demolished all of its family high-rises, mm -hmm. the, the, the public housing high-rises. So essentially what they're left with is the buildings that were senior buildings, right? All well, the, the high-rise mm -hmm. buildings that they still have. Well, they have, so they have, um, currently today, they have 88 buildings with 153 elevators. Mm -hmm. um, about two-thirds of those buildings house seniors. There's still some family housing. Okay. Um, you know, not all of them are high-rises. So it's Caroline Hedger, which houses seniors, is a 28-story building. Yeah. But there are other buildings that are shorter, a uh, couple stories high. So there are buildings that are like, I guess, what, like four or five stories? Right, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, the situation would be less critical in a five story building if it's not occupied by people who are in wheelchairs and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. But I mean, I, I have to say that the first thought I had when I was reading this was my God, you have a high rise building. It's not uncommon for there to be fires in high rise buildings, mm -hmm. and you have two elevators, and one of them is not working. You tell this awful story of a of a of a woman who was kind of waiting you know her, her daughter had come over to get her to take mm -hmm. her to the doctor and i mean the, the the nut of this story is that they sat in the lobby on the on their floor for an hour waiting for the ele the elevator was working but it was the only one in the building and you couldn't get on it by the time you got to the i mean this what what would happen if they were trying to evacuate that building? You know, it's so interesting because a lot of the residents that we talked to 
posed that question, what if we needed to get out and we couldn't? Yeah. Um, and so the, the woman that you're mentioning, Kim Campos Lucas, she has actually thought about this repeatedly and has, you know, they, they, they've thought about how they're going to maybe between her and her husband could carry their mom down the stairs. But, you know, it's it's 20 they, She lives in the 23rd floor. So going down 23 stories would be very difficult yeah, to carry yeah, someone. Yeah. And again, we are talking about elderly people. So uh, some of them are more fit than others, but a large number of them use various kinds of appliances, maybe a wheelchair or a walker or something like that. And, mm -hmm. and going even down 10, stair, 10 flights of stairs would be really difficult. And that was, you know, some of the things that I thought was heartbreaking when I talked, talked to residents. I mean, we talked to one woman who said that she's so afraid to use the elevator, to, to get stuck in the elevator, that she rather go down three flights of stairs. She has uh, trouble with her vision and she has respiratory problems and she still uses the stairs because she's so afraid of the elevators. And that's just heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. Women, we, we talk about to, to another woman who waited six hours in the lobby of her building before she can go back to her apartment because the elevators were down. Um, she had to store her groceries in the uh, buildings in the that thankfully the lobby had a refrigerator oh, and she good. could store her groceries in there but still waiting for six hours before you can get home. It shouldn't be happening. And and just story after story of, of the same kind of thing of, of, of people who it's somewhere between a disaster and an inconvenience. I mean, the, the, they didn't, as, as the CHA likes to point out, they didn't get hurt in any of this. Mm. But I think that's a kind of a disingenuous answer because they're, they're, uh, they're harmed and, and they're scared. And being scared is a pretty bad situation to be in. Yeah, and then going back to what you said earlier about you know the failed inspection and still issue a certificate mm -hmm. to, to for the elevators. So what we found was that um, the the city's building department, which is tasked with elevator safety, did not um, require a past inspection until uh, they 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 issued. The requirement in 2016, but it was actually formalized in 2017. Mm -hmm. um, so elevators could still be um, operational, even though in, they're not they're failing inspections. Today, that has changed. Uh, the commissioner said that they they changed that requirement and they now require a pass inspection. But it's still, um, it's it's a big question mark for CHA buildings whether or not they're actually passing inspections. Wow. Earlier this year, um, the an inspection results show that uh, about two thirds of the elevators did not pass an inspection just this year alone. And is that your understanding that's the current status? Uh, that's my understanding is the current status. So two thirds, two thirds of the elevators serving CHA residents, most of whom are elderly, have not passed, or let, let's not say have not passed, have failed inspections, right? Is that accurate? Earlier this year, yeah, failed, yeah. failed an inspection earlier this year. Yeah, that is accurate. Could you imagine, could you imagine a high rise building along Lakeshore Drive at, you know, I don't know, 2400 North or something with that, or, or a series of buildings with, with that kind of problem, the city would be all over them. Hmm. The, I mean, this would be, this would be, this would be a major story. You know, and we, we wanted to know that. So we actually asked the city to give us their entire yeah. database, right? So they mm -hmm. have created this program. Uh, and the way it works is that when the, the private inspector reports back to the city, they go into a, a website, there's there's a database that they input the information, yes, I inspected the elevator, yes, the elevator passed, or no, the elevator failed. And it's all computerized. So uh -huh. we asked the city, give us that database, and, and we will want to look that, yeah, I mean, which, yeah. which buildings are failing inspections, all their than the CHA, um, if any, right? Mm -hmm. and, and they just declined to give us that yeah, data. Yeah. Well, one thing that you, one very good indication you have is looking at fire department logs. I mean, it looks to me like the fire department has more engagement with the tenants of the CHA buildings than the CHA people do. What are these numbers? 167 right. dispatches? So, uh, and that was just to, so we, we looked at um, buildings that have not passed an inspection mm -hmm. um, since since 2015. So that's the number 167 that you mentioned. But when we look at overall at the 88 um, CHA buildings, so we, we used 2015 numbers to be fair, mm -hmm. basically. And so at the time it was 80, um, five CHA buildings. And what we found was that firefighters were four times more likely to receive at least one call 
to rescue someone from an elevator in CHA buildings than in the rest of the city, four times. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's, I mean, we're talking about large numbers of, of fire calls to basically pry the doors open to let people out who are trapped in elevators, right? Right, it's, um, in the four years and then in 2017, it was mm -hmm. more than 600 calls, nearly 700 to, to pry open elevators at CHA buildings. <laughs> Let's say that again. It, almost 700 times the Chicago Fire Department had to, you're managing the CHA? You are, you are on the board of the CHA, or you are, are one of the top managers of the CHA, and you know that 700 times the Chicago Fire Department has, to come, has had to come to your properties to rescue people out of stuck elevators, mm -hmm. and you don't say, somebody bring me the records from 2016, and let me see how many inspections we had and how many we failed in 2016. Oh, sorry, boss, we didn't, we didn't inspect anything 2016. Yeah, I mean, when, when we looked at the numbers with 911 calls, I mean, even the, from 2016 to 2017, there was a spike 79% higher. Um, there were 79% more calls in 2017 than in 2016 uh, when we looked at the numbers. And 2017, let me, let me check. Uh, yeah, that was last year. <laughs> I mean, we're not talking about like some ancient history thing here. We're talking about a few months ago. Right. Okay, so they've hired somebody for a million dollars a year to, to just inspect these elevators, right? And to maintain them. So, they, and this is where it gets, it well, gets they, a little this complicated. Is, this wouldn't be, uh -huh. these, are the, the, to actually fix them? No, so they have, um, the CHA has uh, contr ma monthly maintenance contracts with, with maintenance companies, mm -hmm. um, and, and that's where the million, about a million dollar comes. Uh, and it's, it's something that we extrapolated because there actually a lot of records were missing, but based on the records that, that the CHA provided to us, we can extrapolate that number to almost a million. Um, and and um, the monthly um, maintenance contracts um, are basically very broad. I mean, when we talked to experts, they told us that they, um, with especially with buildings in senior buildings and CHA buildings, they they recommend a monthly uh, preventative maintenance for every elevator. Mm -hmm. um, and when we looked at the contracts, we were actually surprised to find that there was very few details that it allows the companies to um, basically, they have the capacity to decide what the elevator needs or doesn't need. Mm. Uh, when we talked to one of the companies the CHA hired, they told us, oh yeah, we do the, the monthly maintenance, uh, preventative maintenance every month. And then we were like, well, where are the records? And mm -hmm. so the CHA gave us almost 5,000 pages worth of records. Most of them were handwritten notes and we put them together into binders, we created a spreadsheet, and we found was that there are, um, for many of the buildings, there are no records of, of monthly. There's actually 10 buildings for which they gave us no records at all. And uh, in the rest of them were spotty. There were preventative maintenance some years, but not others, preventative maintenance some months, but not other months. And when you're talking about, I mean, what um, the expert told us were, was that the records are crucial, right? I mean, this is how you know what's being done to the elevators. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have the records, it's questionable whether the maintenance is being done, whether things are being repaired, mm -hmm. um, or, or whether it's just, you know, at the very minimum, just a record keeping issue. Yeah, you talk about um, this, uh, well, first of all, I think it's really cool that you talk to a bunch of um, industry people and experts to talk about what is the standard and, and how should a building like this be operated. And I think, I think it's fair to say you found that what they told you was not consistent with what you found in those <laughs> seven pounds of uh, papers that they sent over to you. But... I, I think really one that stood out to me is this idea that elevators, and I'm sure almost all elevators in Chicago get this, but periodically they need to go through like a kind of a stress test where mm -hmm. you need to, you know, guys actually ride up on top of the cabs and, and they simulate problems and, and you know, see how, see how well the elevator stands up to brake issues or whatever it might be, or, or does it run too fast, for example, that kind of thing. And if you can't prove that that's been done on your elevators, then, I don't know, I, I, what else can you say? You're just being negligent. Well, we, right, so this, the safety test, so the, the requirements in the city are a, a yearly inspection, 
a yearly safety test, which is so those are some of the things that you were mentioning, safety and whether or not the elevator is moving too fast. Mm -hmm. um, and then there is something called a category five test. It's a, a five year test. And, and what that does is the uh, mechanics actually load the elevator with weights and oh, actually really? test that, uh -huh. you know, if it speeds too fast, that uh -huh. it actually will stop. Uh -huh. um, and then for what they call hydraulic elevators, then you have a, every, a, a category three test every three years. Uh, um, and what those records are supposed to be kept by the CHA, six years worth of records are required to be kept. And we, when we looked at the records, not only we only found, we only found a handful of tests, um, uh, results, but we also uh, looked at elevator violations issued by the city of Chicago, mm -hmm. and they have been cited numbers of times for not doing the safety tests. Mm. And, and I, yeah, I guess you know that's an interesting point that you raised too. Is that in lower buildings you have hydraulic elevators that where the, it's actually kind of like a piston that runs mm -hmm. up and down, but in the taller buildings you have all these hoistways with cables mm -hmm. and motors up at the top and everything. And I was just stunned to read that that some of the CHA buildings we're talking about were built in the 50s, and that. The mechanical systems in those buildings have never been, they've never been updated, they've never been modernized. We're talking about, you know, we're talking about before the advent of color television, you know? I mean, that long. I just, I don't understand that. And, and oh, 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 yes. And the biggest outrage of all, that during all of the money that, that with all the money that C, CHA has been spending in the last few years upgrading these buildings, and to their credit, they have done some very nice upgrades in these senior buildings. What they do is they go in and they modernize the car, the elevator car, right? But they don't go up top into the, into the penthouse and replace all of the motors and brake systems and signal systems. You know, I don't get this. I mean, we're at a point now where you can you can put control systems for complicated things into an iPhone, right? Mm -hmm. And here you have these rooms with huge old electromechanical controls and everything, and it hasn't it hasn't been updated. I mean, I don't understand that. You know, it's difficult for us to understand too. So the the one the biggest example that I have of that it's it's a building called Carolyn Hedger. It's a, a 28 story building uh, in Rogers Park. It's, it's 26 stories of apartments and then two stories of uh, um, um, equipment, like elevator equipment mm -hmm. and, and um, boilers and whatnot. Um, and it has 449 units. It has three elevators, and the CHA recently spent about $45 million rehabbing the building, $45 mm -hmm. million. It was um, way beyond its budget. It was more than a year late. Uh, and when I, when I started, you know, I was reporting on that story when I realized that the elevators kept breaking down. And, and I, you know, sometimes seniors had to wait. I mean, I was waiting with some of them. You um, had a $45 million <laughs> rehab and the right. elevators don't work. I, I mean, I sat with one woman uh, waiting for the elevator for 15 minutes and the doors opened and it was full because only one was operational. And she like went back to her uh, apartment, ditched her walker and wobbled back to sit next to me to see if maybe that way she could get into the elevator. Um, and so that made me start thinking, well, what exactly what exactly are they spending money on and, yeah. and what's going on? And and that's when we looked at, um, I looked at the elevators and what they were going to do with the elevators. And it turns out that they were just going to uh, make them look pretty. And mm -hmm. they look really pretty. I'm sure they do. Uh, New lighting they, <laughs> and everything. Yeah. But yeah. they keep breaking down. Yeah, yeah. So is that was that the origin of the story? Is that how this story started? Yeah, from me going and visiting, really? um, yeah, seniors, and then um, there was um, I was going to um, a public housing hearing, and at the hearing I heard about them spending three point five million dollars on, on elevators assessments, and immediately it was you know my editors and I thinking, wait a minute, yeah. an assessment? Shouldn't they yeah. know what's yeah, going yeah, on with yeah. their elevators? Why do you need an assessment? Yeah. Right. I'm always fascinated by how these big blockbuster stories get started. What was the spark that ignited it? And, and it's always something like that. It's just like a, a curious reporter seeing something and thinking, That's, that looks a little hinky, you know, that, there's something wrong with that. Um, we also have this phenomenon of the, with the uh, city of Chicago where 
uh, the first response when they know that reporters are working on a story that's going to get ugly is to deny, 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 mm -hmm. and then uh, to try to figure out some way to try to get on top of the story. And they did this to you guys. The, like a month before your story came out, they announced that they were going to spend $25 million on elevator rehabs, right? Right, so there was a public hearing, you know, they had announced the assessment, right, and then we were waiting and we were asking them questions about what exactly this elevator modernization program was going to look like, and it wasn't even in the agenda for the public hearing, so we actually had someone there to babysit the hearing in case they said anything, and they did, and they talked about um, how the, now that the elevators have been assessed, they're going to issue a bid, uh, and, and they expect that it will cost them $25 million to actually fix all of the elevator problems and that it won't be ready until 2020. So seniors still will have to wait a little while. So then when you um, announce that you have this story and when you start to break the story, they can say, that's old news. We, we knew about that. We're already, we already spending, spending $25 million. We're going to fix this problem. That's what they told me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, we've been there before. We've seen this before. Um, and of course, the CHA said that your assertions were without merit. That was their uh, was their quote, right? They gave you a bunch of reports, but they didn't give you a lot of the stuff that you actually had FOIA'd, I understand? We, you know, we try for months repeatedly to speak with them. We not only asked to, you know, we wanted to have a sit-down interview, uh, a, a sit-down conversation first, and then we formally requested an interview, and time and time again, they denied us the ability to come and talk to uh, officials. We wanted to speak to an official, um, and we, they finally we were forced to, with just giving them questions and, and that uh, we send them, uh, I think it was 18 questions, maybe they were a little bit more than that, and they responded with a statement and a lot of our questions were ignored. Just a, just a written statement, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So, um, final thought, do, do you believe that uh, um, the situation for residents in these buildings is gonna get better as a result of all of your, your stories and your work? I think that seniors deserve, deserve better. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think about my my parents and my grandparents, and and I I think that they deserve to be able to go to the grocery store and know that they can come back and go to their apartment immediately. Yeah, I yeah. think that they deserve to be able to have working elevators that could take them to um, the you know to to go shopping, to go to their medical appointments. Um, I don't think they should be living this way. Neither do I for what it's worth, I'll, I'll throw in with you on that. Alejandro, thanks so much for being with us today. I, was, I, I really enjoyed your series. I thought it was very well done. Congratulations to you and the BGA and BEZ. Uh, nice, nice work. Thank you. Thanks. Alejandro Cancino uh, joining us uh, on the program. And um, well, you know how this works. Uh, we we uh, do these kind of interviews all the time here on, on Chicago Newsroom. And we'll be back again next week with yet another one. We got a couple of things happening next week that I think are going to be very interesting. We'll see how that develops. Uh, thank you for watching. And remember, you can visit us anytime by going to this address where you can see our archive of almost four shows. <laughs> it's been a long time. And uh, we'll be back again next week. Thanks again. Bye-bye.